Welcome to the Western Vowel Podcast Series, with talks on traditional spiritual teaching and its application in the world today. The intention of the series is to offer something useful for those who are drawn to study themselves and engage practice on the spiritual path. New talks are posted twice each month. The content of the talks is for informational purposes only and not to provide any kind of counseling, medical, or professional advice. This podcast is titled Threshold, Spirituality and Ecology Here at the Changing of the Guard. The talk was given by Mary Angelon Young on December 2nd, 2023, via Zoom. Angelon is a workshop leader with a background in Jungian psychology, an editor and author of As It Is, Under the Punai Tree, The Bowel Tradition, Caught in the Beloved's Petticoats, Enlightened Duality with Lee Lozowick, Krishna's Heretic Lovers, The Art of Contemplation, and other books. She begins the talk with a recording of a song titled Changing of the Guard and speaks about spiritual work in liminal times, in the in-between state of a changing and shifting world in which we don't know what is going to happen. Reference is made during the discussion to the Council of Thirteen Grandmothers, who are wise female elders from indigenous tradition. Toward the end of the presentation, Angelong summarizes the Mayan creation myth, Popol Vuh. If there is benefit in this talk for you, please consider sharing the link to it or writing a review on social media or on one of the podcast platforms. Mary Angelon Young. Well, I want to welcome everybody. Thank you so much for coming. We're going to start with a song and set some mood, and then I'm going to talk for a while and open things up. This is a song written by my teacher, Lee Loswick. Lyrics are by him. It's him singing. The songs were particularly, I think, meaningful for him as he was looking at his own transition from this world. Let's hear the song.
how it all came down. Do we even see it clear? Do we know what's coming around? Are we rushing headlong to the slaughter palace? Thinking it's paradise and that we found the chance. These are wild, these are wild, wild times. Here at the changing. These are wild, these are wild, wild times. Here at the changing. These are the That's a very strong song that we just listened to. Certainly, Lee, my teacher, mentor, and guru, saw our times very clearly even back in the 70s, as did a lot of us, including me. In 1972, 73, out in the out back the wilderness of the Ozark Mountains. I just didn't see things continuing the way they were. I felt like many in my generation that the infrastructures were going to all fall apart and we needed to find a way to survive that or to find a sustainable way to live. And of course, that evolved over the next 50 years for me into a deepening on the spiritual path. And that, of course, being where we find what is sustainable. And that's really what this talk is about the intersection between spirituality, ecology, and culture in these wild, wild times. So I want to begin with saying, what do I mean by culture? Because if we look at the definition of culture, it's the art, beliefs, the products of society, the philosophy, the thought of human beings, things that human beings create, the attitudes and all of that. It's a big, big subject. It's a big milieu that we live in. It's what we're living in. Here we are in it. We're immersed in it. And spirituality, I think we all know what is meant by that. If we're here at this podcast, we know in general what is meant by that. Ecology, the relationship between organisms and their environment. So there's so much to be said on these subjects. And I am not a scientist. I'm taking a very specific point of view tonight. I'm going to go through the doorway of Tantra and some of the other spiritual practices and teachings that I've engaged over a lot of years and decades and the ways that I'm synthesizing those and putting those together and finding the ground that I need to walk on in these wild times and in these days. And they are very liminal times. And we hear this word a lot right now. If we're listening at all to the visionaries and just ordinary people who are expressing what's going on for us, We know that we are in the in-between. It's a really changing and shifting world. And all of the old forms, cultural, religious, social, all of it, the earth herself, everything is shifting. And it's changing. And we don't know what's going to happen. So I find myself starting talks with that a lot, whether it's a workshop or a talk on Zoom or something, because I have a commitment to... How can we live with reality as it is? How can we live with what is and find the golden thread through that, which has become a real primary metaphor for me? And how do we find reality in a world that is so predominantly unreal, even with the onset of AI and more technology, which has tremendous potential to benefit humanity and tremendous potential to not benefit humanity at all, but to be disastrous. So how do we find what is real? And how do we learn to live in that? How do we live with reality? So the world has changed. And it's not going to be the same. And I think many people are beginning to understand that as the pandemic brought home to us and revealed, just bared the truth of so many things that had been swept under the carpet, or we were not paying attention to collectively, maybe individuals were, but collectively, things have changed and they're not going back to the old way. And the old way wasn't working anyway. It was riddled with denial and selfishness and greed and 
bigotry and all of the things that we deal with as human beings. When I think about this intersection of spirituality, ecology, and culture, how am I relating with the earth? How am I relating with human culture in the world? How am I relating with the culture inside of me? Because that's really of tremendous interest to me because we do craft and build a culture within our own inner world, our inner yoga. And that's all a huge part of how we're going to establish ourselves in reality and live with reality so that, another lyric from Lee, so that we can find the joy in the cracks between our sorrows and these liminal times. And we can find out, we can discover how to live in this in-between, in the in-between. I spent a lot of years in my guru's intimate company. And one of the things that I witnessed him as a human being and as a teacher was his tremendous capacity for change. And he could hold on to something for a very long time, but when it was time to let it go and change it, he did it. And I saw him do this with his teaching. I saw him allow his teaching to flower and unfold and change. Just as one example, back in the 70s and on into the 80s, the word enlightenment, of course, a really popular word, and it's not like he stopped using it completely. He would never use that word in relationship to himself. He would say, my students think I'm enlightened. When he referred to the change that happened for him when he started teaching, he would say the event that catalyzed my teaching work. And he started saying, this isn't about enlightenment. This isn't about enlightenment. If you got it, you wouldn't like it. There's so, so many things that I witnessed, Lee, being able to flow with change. I saw him also sometimes fight change. It seems that we human beings, we need to let things ripen all the way. Our karmas have to ripen until finally we're ready to let go and let the river flow and let the change happen. So this capacity to be able to change and to recognize in ourselves when change is necessary the part that we as individuals can do to help the world, the anima mundi, the world soul, what we can do to help that is that we start changing. Not that we can force ourselves to change, but that we plow the ground so that change may happen for us in a graceful way. I'm not promoting that we willfully force ourselves to be different, but that we We sow the seeds, we till the ground, we work the ground, we work with becoming more and more fluid and opening up, opening up and letting go, opening up and letting go. So I'd like to begin with just a little bit about the tantric tradition. And these are some of the core essential tenets of tantra in the Hindu tradition. I mean, there's a lot that could be said. We could give hours and hours of talks on Tantra and many different perspectives on it. But these are some of the essentials as I've synthesized them and integrated them over years of working with those principles actively in the inner yoga and creation of inner culture that I'm talking about that's necessary for us and is becoming more and more vitally crucial for us as we go deeper into wild, wild times. So, of course, right up at the top of the list of core essential tantric practices is non-rejection. And so one way of understanding non-rejection is that we don't turn a blind eye to anything. We face what it is. We take what is arising as our path. And so when we're saying no, 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 no to the thing that might be happening for us that's very difficult and very painful, we work with the no. And then we work with the no until slowly, slowly, maybe it can become a yes. So that's one little way of understanding non-rejection. In Tantra, for example, we don't reject sexuality in some spiritual practices. Celibacy is the path in Tantra. It's not. You might not be having any sex, but there's not a rejection of that aspect of life. So we keep our eyes open. We stay open. I want to bring in this idea of Pratyahara, which is one of the eight teachings of Patanjali. It's in the Yoga Sutras, Pratyahara. It's often translated as renunciation. But having worked with this a lot for many years, my personal experience is very connected to 
letting go of identifications, of freeing ourselves. We're going to get back to this in just a minute. Freeing ourselves from identifications and deep, deep attachments, including the spiritual ones. Because one of the things that I hear happening for many of my friends, and I hear not only people who are, say, in my sangha, but in other walks of life or in other traditions saying that even the practices that they have done or that I have done for decades of time that were sacred and completely vital and precious and immensely important, of profound importance for years, that in some kind of way they're not sufficing. And that comes back to this thing, this willingness to change and this willingness to understand that the spiritual path is a living stream that we enter into. And it will take us and it will keep changing and it will change the face of what we need. It will give us different challenges at different times. And that may mean that a time comes when this practice that we've done for many years, it's not sufficing for us. It's not providing the nourishment and the inner generation of self-sustaining spiritual awareness, even just keeping us aware to what's going on. It's not providing ground for us. And it's not that we necessarily give it up completely. But maybe something else is needed. So we're responding to the need of what's present right now, not what was in the past. Which kind of brings us to this tantric practice of the in-between. My ancestors were Celts, and I'm so happy about that. I'm glad that I had some ancestors somewhere way back there who were wild, completely wild. <laughs> So one of the big teachings in Celtic spirituality is this living in the in-between, and that's the liminal state. So Tantra is teaching us, and not only Tantric practice, but I would say all spiritual practice is going to lead us sooner or later to the in-between, to this state that's between, that's liminal, that we don't know. We don't know what's going to happen. And we're also in between duality and non-duality, being able to have our awareness present in both non-duality and duality in the moment. We know that oneness is true, and yet our attention needs to be free and available in this world of manifestation and of polarities. So the in-between and threshold practice, liminal practice, we cultivate an inner culture of that, The more we do that, the more we're going to be able to bear the onslaught of what is happening in the world and the suffering that's going on in the world. And that's a huge, huge part of spiritual practice. The Buddhists have this beautiful word, bodhisattva, the bodhisattva practice and bodhicitta, loving awareness of what's going on in the world. So many beautiful teachings and descriptions of that. But you find it everywhere because it is essential to the path. So that. Living with reality as it is, living in the in-between. And then there's the worship of an Ishta Devata, however that is for you. Ishta Devata is a Sanskrit term that means your chosen deity. Your chosen deity might be a seamless, formless, non-dual devotion to the supreme reality. However that is for any one of us as an individual, it's this capacity to have reverence and gratitude for that and for the gift of life. So one of my teacher, Lee, one of his most pith and core teachings on Tantra is that the only doorway to God is the feminine. Just recently published in our ashram journal, Sahaja, a transcript of Lee giving this teaching, um, the only doorway to God is the feminine. And it was wonderful to touch that again, because for me, it's essential to this whole consideration of spirituality, ecology, and culture. If we're not rooted in the fact of our being, the ground of our being, being this earth and the five elements, then we will not be able to find the golden thread, the sustainable spiritual inner culture that we're looking for to carry us through whatever is coming in the years ahead. 
I discovered recently this long poem by Tagore. Tagore is a Bengali poet who won the Nobel Prize back at the turn of the 20th century. He's long dead now. He was a Baal. There's a university dedicated to him in Shantiniketan in Bengal in India. And there's 280, I think, couplets. And I fell in love with them. So I'm going to read a couple off and on during this talk. Here's one from Tagore. My heart beats her waves at the shore of the world and writes it upon her signature in tears with the words, I love thee. Because the deeper we go into the spiritual path, the more our hearts become broken and the more we recognize our love for everything, for the world, for the suffering in the world, for the trees, for the animals, for the oceans, for every single thing. My Mahaguru, his name was Yogi Ram Sarat Kumar, Yogi Ram Sarat Kumar. He died in 2001. And we were celebrating what would have been his 105th birthday yesterday. And we were watching a video in which someone who was very close to him, Kaylor Wadlington, was remembering a time when Yogi Ram Sarat Kumar had said to him, if you do your sadhana only for yourself, it is not a true sadhana. You must do your sadhana for the whole world. Then it is a true and virtuous sadhana. And of course, he made many, many such statements. So for me, at the center and the depth of that statement is this love of the world, this recognition of the beauty and the sweetness and also the heartbreak that we have. Tagore says, through the sadness of all things, I hear the crooning of the eternal mother. So I'm going to go into something a little bit different here. I'd like for you just to keep some of these principles in mind that I've gone over. And of course, there's so much more. And also this teaching that the only doorway to God, the supreme reality, to self-realization, whatever kind of words we want to put on our spiritual aspiration, whatever terms you like to use that the path to that is a feminine path. And for me, that means the earth, the ecology of the earth, my relationship as an organism with the earth and bringing as much love and praise to that as I can. So I want to share some really wonderful quotes. It's from an online magazine called Emergence. And it's established and managed by uh, Emmanuel Von Lee, who is the son of Llewellyn Von Lee, who was a very dear spiritual friend to me, someone who helped me a lot, especially after my guru died. He's an amazing teacher. And uh, he lives mostly in seclusion now. He's a Sufi teacher, Llewellyn, and his son Emmanuel is, I think, carrying on for him. So these quotes are from Emmanuel, and his work has a lot to do with the relationship between the emerging spirituality, what is beginning to happen in this world as the world soul changes in relationship with this moment in time where we are, where things are changing so fast and so radically and in such unprecedented ways. One of the things that I've noticed with a lot of my friends who are devoted and committed to the spiritual path, there's still a feeling of, let's don't put our attention out there because we want to stay focused on the path. But actually, rather than let's just withdraw from the world and don't deal with how much suffering there is and just go for my own enlightenment or my own freedom and my own liberation, what's emerging is a much more inclusive oneness perspective of we're all in this together and life is calling for us to be together so i want to read a few little pieces from him he's uh, giving this talk on liminal times and you can listen to it on the emergence magazine podcast or you can read the transcript the full transcript emmanuel says There is a space that has opened up, especially in the last years, as the pandemic laid bare so many aspects of our civilization and our way of being that were not just unsustainable, they were unreal. And this space that opened up between the worlds is as much an invitation 
to step into a new way of being as it is a challenge to all of us to find our bearings. It's a paradox. It's a contradiction. It's also an invitation. So how can we navigate, find our bearings, operate? Not only that, but to find a way in the midst of all of this that's going on to actually offer something of ourselves and begin to be in relationship with something that is much bigger than ourselves. It's a new possibility that invites us by necessity into a space that hasn't been before. So I loved this talk because I felt like he was so speaking what is true for me. And one of the things that he says near the beginning of it is that it begins with acknowledging what is. He might not use that exact language, but he says that the first step is to acknowledge the space that we're in, to acknowledge the reality of the time that we're in. And that we are, in fact, in a place in between a world that has ended and something new that has not yet begun. And we don't know what that is going to be. So it truly is, the Celts say, the betwixt and the between. And in Tantra, this is essentially important. I love to say this. I love this. I love the metaphor and the earthiness of this, that it's said in Tantra that you should always do our practice, our meditation, or our contemplation, or our chanting, or whatever we're doing as a practice. Do it at dawn and dusk, at the in-between times. Do it at the shore of the ocean where the water meets the sand. Because those are power places and power times. The in-between is powerful, which means we have an opportunity right now We have an unimaginable opportunity in this moment in human history that we are incarnated, where we have all this information, tremendous information, quantum physics, astrophysics, astrology, ecology, all of it. We know so much. It's at our fingertips. We have endless access to spiritual traditions and deep inner teachings. We have so much available to us. But again, It's the work of creating that inner culture that makes all of that become alive for us and rich in a way that our awareness is really present here and now. Hermes Trismegistus says, life goes on with you or without you. And I love that. I'm in. I'm all in. I was saying to a friend of mine this morning, as long as the Divine Mother wants me to be a creature in creation, I'm all in. I'm here. We have to acknowledge and we want to witness. We need to witness what is unfolding. We need to bear witness to what it is. We bear witness in a way, and I'm going to quote Llewellyn, witness what is unfolding, witness what is unfolding in front of us in an intimate way in our own lives. And witness what is unfolding in the distance. That is the part of our collective shared experience of these vast changes, these vast shifting landscapes. We have to witness. We have to be responsible and witness. We can't all disappear and live off grid in the wilderness. I loved that statement because I do live off grid in the wilderness. But I find that the deeper my practice goes, the deeper my contemplative life goes and the deeper my inner life goes, I could be on the top of Mount Kailash and I would still be one with the world. I would still be present to what's happening on this planet and in the anima mundi, the world soul. So we can't all disappear and live off grid in the wilderness, but we don't have to buy into it. We don't have to give ourselves to it. Instead, we acknowledge what it really is We can either wake up, really wake up, and enter a different space, or we can stay semi-asleep, not really taking responsibility for what we see, what has been unfolding in the past, and what will unfold in the present. We do have the ability to see. And so Emmanuel, I might have said Llewellyn, it's Emmanuel who's speaking. Emmanuel is talking about stepping back. Being able to be, many teachers have used this phrase, to be in the world, but not of the world. And that's what Emmanuel is talking about, stepping back so that we can have a greater view of what's happening. He says, quote, we are not caught. We are not reacting. We are not gripped in the same way. There is a little space. We see, we perceive, we understand differently. 
The living world, the human world demands our attention as witnesses to acknowledge what is happening, to give it our attention, but not to get caught in it. And he's making a point that we need to do that because when we're completely caught up in it, we cannot serve it. We cannot be available. We cannot witness and bless because we get lost in it. So these are mythic times. Again, from Emmanuel. There is so much at this time that we must witness because the shifts that are unfolding are so monumental. They are mythic. They are mythic. We cannot understand them unless we use the language of myth. When all the ice caps melt and all the seas rise and all the forests burn and all the species die, that is mythic in scale. It dwarfs the biblical. And so the witnessing has many purposes, many levels, and many layers. There is a collective witnessing that is tremendously powerful as we give it our attention. Not gripped in fear, overtaken by eco-anxiety, but witnessing with a space and a maturity that says, I am here to bear witness to you. I acknowledge what is happening, but I am not caught. Because how can I be of use if I'm caught? How can I be of use if I am not free? So I want to stop here for just a moment and invite you all to share anything that you would like to share. I have some more that I want to share with you, of course, because I'm going to tell a story, tell a math story, which is one of the things I love to do, to take this mythopoetic perspective on things to go to the wisdom stories of the cultural and religious traditions that have been in the world for three and 4,000 years and find out what they're saying about how reality works. And of course, what they're saying is that in order for there to be a birth, there's got to be a death. So I invite you to share with everyone because these conversations that we have with each other, this is how we bear witness to the world and what is happening. It's so crucially important, even a little temporary community like this one, via the modern miracle of Zoom and the internet, even little communities like this, here for tonight and then gone later tonight, are important. One issue that I pretty much resolved for myself, but it's still giving me little pangs of semi-guilt, and that is that there's many ways to be an activist today. I was definitely an activist, environmental activist in the distant past. And even now, I belong to one or two organizations and I get their mailings, protect this, protect that. But I find that my particular energy doesn't give me space to be an activist in that way these days. But it does give me qualms because there's so many opportunities to be an activist if I could do it sanely, <laughs> which I think I could these days. So how do you hold this kind of push pull? Well, I think it's a question for every person. I hear many people expressing that. For myself, I have come to long ago, and I still believe that this is true, that the inner work that I do whatever kindness, generosity, and compassion I can generate into the world, however I can serve, that that makes a difference. And keeping my eyes open and my heart open and not turning away, not turning away from the suffering, not turning away from the cries of the earth, not turning away from the cries of people of color, of marginalized people, of war, knowing that that's going on. Years ago, I'm drawing a blank on her name, but she was a Carmelite nun. Tessa Pilecki. Tessa, Tessa Pilecki. <laughs> um, oh, yes, yes. She's a wonderful person and then, of course, uh, committed on a, a very intense spiritual path, a contemplative path all her life since she was 19. And one of the things she said about the contemplative life is she said, if you are in your monastery or whatever, it's your apartment and you're not able to go out and be an activist and do all that. Wherever you are doing your inner work, if you're not one with the world when you're doing that, when you're not aware of what's happening in the world, then it's not a true contemplative life. And I thought it was such a beautiful 
witness from her years and years and years of being sequestered in a monastery and being a reclusive, working in solitude. I mean, she is also politically active now, but that principle that the quality of our inner being makes a difference in this world. That's how I work with that. It's not my calling. I've been out on the streets like you when I was in my 20s and early 30s, especially doing that kind of work. But now it's not my calling. And I think for a lot of us, as we're moving more into being elders, that the calling to serve is really a different path now. It's much more like, where can I be of benefit to others in really simple, small ways, even, especially younger people or or the people who are out there, just the power of prayer, our meditation, our prayer, our chanting, our creativity. When we dedicate those things to the well-being and welfare of all, then that makes a difference. So that's how I hold that. Well, I have a question for you, but before that, you just reminded me of a wonderful story about the contemplatives in witnessing the suffering of the world. I am friends with Sister Michaela Cassidy. She and Brother Francis, they're a hermit monk and nun at Sky Farm, and it was a place that Brother David Sindel Ross used to do hermit retreats. Shortly after the election, the Council of 13 Grandmothers put out a letter And basically they said, we don't know why this is happening. (laughs) But they said, we do know these are liminal times. We know that. And we know you really need to pay attention to your communities. And they quoted this Hopi prophecy about these times, which is that consciousness is changing so fast. It's like this amazing rushing river. And only a few people are able to really dive in and swim. And most people are clinging to the sides of the banks, bare knuckled. They can't do it. And your job is not to leave the river and go try to rescue the people on the banks. Your job is to keep swimming and to look around you and see who's swimming with you. And I told that story to Sister McHale in this look came over her face. She said, oh, but can't we wave to the people on the banks and say the water's fine? Come on in. She was not going to leave those people on the banks. She was going to be waving to them and keep them in her prayers and hope that they will let go and dive into the river. But what I want to ask you is you quoted that the doorway to God is through the feminine. And what is the feminine? Some people see it as a return to the matrilineal ways of being. Some see it. Differently, what I think of as the feminine needs to gain so much strength in our world so that we can come to some sort of balance. So I'd like to hear what you're feeling, what the feminine is. Well, I have to speak what it is for me because I'm not talking about a return to matrilineal culture. You had thousands of years of matrilineal culture in Anatolia and Crete and all of these wonderful places that existed long ago, before the sky gods came in and ran the goddess out. And so there's a lot that can be said on that subject, and we don't have time to go there tonight. But I'm talking about a quality of being that is inside every one of us, and it does not matter what the gender of our body is at all. You know, for the bowels of Bengal, this is so essential to their tantric teaching. Everybody has to become Radha in relationship to Krishna amongst the bowels. So Radha is the feminine side. And the symbolic image of this beautiful woman is used for Radha. And Krishna is the masculine. But there are two pairs of opposites. So we could look at it as logic and intuition. Those are both good things. We need both of them, right? But if one is repressed, the other one is going to be off. It's going to be twisted. It's going to be in shadow in some kind of way. So what you were saying about bringing back a balance, not that it's ever going to be equal. It's not like that. It's a flow. It's an interaction. It's a yin-yang. It's the dance of life, really. But it is so out of balance now. But, you know, one of the ways that I understand the feminine also is that the feminine is this mystery. 
It's this capacity to be in the liminal, to be in the in-between, to be in the I don't know. And to actually to have this deep instinctive trust of the processes of life, which includes death, which includes all of the breakdown, things ripen and ripen and ripen. And then finally, the fruit falls from the vine and rots on the ground and the seeds go in and then another generation. And we know the metaphors. The metaphors are great. If we would really take them to heart, it would be pretty wonderful for us. I tend to take a Western view of the feminine and masculine. It's a little different in Tibetan Buddhism because the feminine side in Tibetan Buddhism tends to be like cutting through, intense, wild, and passionate. And the masculine is the compassion and kindness. But I'm a Westerner. I take a classical Western view of those pairs of opposites. And I tend to experience the feminine as not only the mystery and these deep instinctive processes of life, the body, but also this mother energy is both wild and it's also sweet and it's nurturing and it's nourishing and it's protective and all that, but it's also wild. There's a wildness in the feminine and that part of the feminine really dovetails with what the Tibetan Buddhists say about Dakini energy, the feminine wisdom beings of the Dakinis, they are totally wild. You don't never know what they're going to do, like a volcano or an earthquake. They're wild elemental forces. I sometimes feel a bit torn between positive, helpful posts that I put on Facebook, sharing philosophy and things that are useful and inspiring. That's on the one hand, but sometimes I feel a need to share or expose stuff that I find is either corrupt or not the way things should be. And my concern is whether I should actually be adding to the the negative by posting this stuff. Yes, adding to the negative discourse that's out there. You know, there's karma involved with everything that we do. If you feel that you're serving something, if you're serving clarity, greater clarity with what you're doing, and you really have searched your motives, for why you're doing it. What is your purpose? Is it feeding your highest aspiration and your highest purpose? Or are you getting hooked into the negative discourse that's going on? And there is a huge, overwhelming amount of it. It's just creating more division. For me, I'm cautious about such things because I don't want to be adding to the negative discourse out there. I want to be offering more clarity for people. So if you can educate about something, education is another thing altogether. There are a lot of questionable practices out there in the spiritual world. There's a lot of stuff to be questioned. So how can we educate ourselves and each other and support each other to really have discerning awareness about things? Lee used to say to me, when you have a moment of clarity, when you're not triggered by anything, you're just feeling clear, that is the moment to reaffirm to the universe your intention. That is the time for me to reaffirm and state and declare, I am here. I wish to serve. I wish to be of benefit and be of use. I wish to bring clarity to the world. Our highest aspirations are our deepest aspirations. When we have moments of clarity, we keep asserting that. And so when we fall off the horse of our practice and our aspiration, how fast can we get back on? It's always that. I'm also thinking about things that Swami Papa Ram Das said about how it's difficult to conceive of a God that is loving in the midst of all the painful things that are happening in the world, but that that's also an expression of the divine, natural catastrophes, and maybe even human catastrophes, that that's an expression of the all. Yeah. This thing about a new consciousness that's trying to be birthed in our species This is very, not only intriguing to me, but it rings true to me. 
And so from a really big picture, in order for that new consciousness to be born, things have to die. A lot of things have to die. I mean, we can ask, why were we even born just to suffer and die? So we can get you know upset with God about these things. But this is the way that the universe is designed. The cosmos, it's happening on a cosmic level. It's happening everywhere. It's happening to suns and solar systems and galaxies. We know this now, right? From physics and from astrophysics and what science has told us. This is what's happening with life. Can we trust that behind all of this is a love bigger and grander than an infinite? We can't even imagine what that is. It's like when Arjuna says to Krishna, show me your universal form, and he shows him, and Arjuna says, I can't take it. It's so overwhelming. So we're limited. Swami Ramdas says, suffering softens the heart of man, which is the thing that is necessary to realize one's something like this, one's oneness with others, with all. It's just a lot. It is a lot. But we keep getting broken open. So we're going to get bigger. And we're going to get bigger and bigger. And there's grief involved in it too. And that's the subject that almost always comes up. Because grief is is so much a part of our human experience. And it is an alchemical element of it. And so all of these, our doubts, our darkest hours, our midnight oracles, I like to call them. Waking up at three or four in the morning. Okay, (laughs) what is the midnight oracle saying to me? I say midnight oracle, I'm speaking metaphorically, because that thing can happen any time of the 24 hours. But it's probably at its most stark when it's about four in the morning or midnight or two in the morning. when We've been asleep for a while. The deep, deep, deep self in us is saying, wake up, wake up, (laughs) you know. Wake up, ladies and say, get with the program. Well, what is the program? The program is death and birth and death and birth and death and birth and becoming. And here we go. At some point, the more we work the ground of all of this, the more heartbroken we become and the more grief we're willing to feel, the more love and joy begins to bubble up in the cracks between our sorrows of all of this, of all of this. And we began to praise. I want to tell a story. It's not really a story. It's a creation myth. And it's from the Mayan Book of Counsel. And I really love this, that we just went through Thanksgiving. And now we're headed toward the winter solstice. These are the darkest days of the year. And then there will be the return of the light. The 21st, it's the darkest day of the year. But it's called the return of the light because everything in our solar system and on our planet shifts so that the days are going to be longer and the light returns. This is a teaching for us about life and about how do we bear all of this? How do we make sense out of it? How do we find the golden thread to get through it? So the book of counsel, anybody know this creation myth? Okay, well, here we go. At the beginning of time on this planet, there was nothing but sky and water. There was no creation. And there was a team of deities called the Great Knowers, and they're the ones who were making this whole creation happen. They made the earth happen, and they made the waters in the sky happen. The sovereign feathered serpent, who was one of the great Mayan deities, was existing in the vast waters of the world. But there were no landforms, no valleys, no plains, no mountains, no plants, no animals. So of the great knowers, there was this group of three, three, of course, always being a really important number in all myths and stories and in most great spiritual traditions, there's three. The three of them were known as heart of heaven. Individually, their names were Hurricane, which is what we know today as Hurricane, Newborn Thunderbolt, and Sudden Thunderbolt. That's heart of heaven. This is all symbolic language. One of the ways that we can play with a myth and work with a myth and deepen into a myth is just let every part of it be a part of us even. So, but back to the story. So part of heaven 
decides to come down and speak with Sovereign Feathered Serpent. And they say, we are curious. We are curious about creation. We wonder what the dawn will look like. And we wonder what the colors of the dusk will be. And we're so curious and so full of wonder about all of this, part of heaven said, that they begin to imagine and they imagine. And as they imagine mountains, plains, valleys, trees, plants, flowers, animals, clouds, rain, everything happens. And that's their first creation. And they look around and part of heaven says, this is good. But something is missing. Something is still missing. None of these creatures even know that we're here. So they decide that they're going to do some more imagining. Because what they're really craving is they're craving for their creation and all of their creatures to have a sense of wonder at the fact that they've been created and to have gratitude for the gift of their existence. And so Heart of Heaven, Hurricane, Newborn Thunderbolt, and Sudden Thunderbolt, they set about creating a second time. And this time they create beings, they create people, human beings sort of, but they're out of mud. And they go, oh, this is pretty good. But then when the rains come, when the storm hits, the mud people just melt. They just can't stand up. They just can't keep their form at all. They melt back into the earth. So heart of heaven looks around and says, okay, let's try again. We believe that this creation can happen. We're curious and we're going to imagine the next creatures and the next creature that they imagine, the people, are made out of sticks. And that seems pretty good. And the stick people are able to make things and fashion things. And they have even technologies. And and that's kind of cool. But they're also very rigid. And they're hard-hearted. And they're wooden. And they're obstinate. And they're not open to the world around them or the creatures of the world. So the animals rebelled against them and their technologies. And it becomes very clear that all of creation was starting to speak out against them. Even the things that the stick people had made were turning against them. So Heart of Heaven looked at them and said, this isn't it either. We need to keep imagining. So let's imagine another creation. So this is their third one. And they take from corn and they make the people, this is their third creation of people, they make them from corn. And so the corn people are actually really amazing. They're able to do all kinds of things. And not only can they do all kinds of things, they're aware of the world around them and they express gratitude and praise. And they actually can recognize heart of heaven and even the old knowers, all of the knowers, the great knowers. So it seems as if the project of creation is complete because finally the created people can offer praise and gratitude to heart of heaven and the knowers. But another problem arises. And, you know, there's always a problem because problems seem to keep creation going. So another problem arises and the great knowers come to heart of heaven and they say, this isn't working for us because you gave those people too many gifts and now they think they're as good as we are and that's not good. We can't have that. Some of us Westerners will remember as an aside here in the story, this Greek god Prometheus who takes fire to humanity and punishment for that because that's not okay. The gods on Mount Olympus are not happy with Prometheus for having done that at all. And so Zeus chains him to a rock and every day an eagle comes and eats his liver and every night his liver grows back and the next day the eagle comes and eats it again so it's like he's going to be punished forever but eventually he'll be rescued by Heracles or somebody like that still the gods don't like it if we become too full of ourselves and we think that we're just like them so the great knowers say well we're going to have to destroy these people too And I think there might be a flood involved and some things like that. But Heart of Heaven goes to bat for the corn people and says to the great knowers, once a gift of creation has been given, we cannot take it back. We have to allow it. 
And so the great knowers and heart of heaven, they compromise. And the compromise that they come to is that heart of heaven will limit the corn people. The corn people still have many, many gifts. And they have that essential spark of oneness and their capacity for wonder and joy and praise at the beauty of creation. But they are limited. So that is the essence. If you ever read the Popol Vuh, you'll see that it's very complicated, long, long, long stories with a whole bunch of tangents and many other characters. But that's in a nutshell what that particular myth is telling us. And it's telling us a lot of different things, of course. It's telling us about how important imagination is and being curious and to keep going, persevere. Heart of Heaven doesn't stop just because Maybe the first several efforts aren't exactly what Heart of Heaven wanted. Heart of Heaven keeps working with the creation. But limitation is a part of it. And it's interesting in that story, in that creation myth, that the Mayan wise people, like those who wrote the Vedas and all of the great uh, seers of the world over thousands of years of time, they saw that. That which has created us really wants us to look back on our creator with gratitude and praise and in wonder and in awe. Even at the fact of all of the death that happens, after death always comes a birth. So at this time, when something new is trying to be born out of the ashes and the confusion and the doubt and the wild, wild, wild times, here we are in the in-between, the old and the new, it's very important for us to look for a mythic perspective, to look for a big picture of what's going on. And I find it so helpful, so helpful to look at nature. What's nature doing? How's it working? How does this work? That is a big part of the gift of this interface between spirituality and ecology that's been growing for quite a few decades now. And I wanted to take a little short dive into it tonight and offer my appreciation for it. It means a lot to me personally. It's gotten me through some hard times being able to look with these new eyes in lots of different kinds of ways. And to be able to understand that everything is changing, including me. So any last moment questions or comment? I was really taken by the reference to Llewellyn Vaughan Lee and his son Emmanuel. Particularly, this is another of these instances of synchronicity for me, because I've been reading a book by Llewellyn called For Love of the Real. Can I read about Six lines of the introduction. Sure. So it's called Before the Beginning. Before the beginning, where there is neither form nor emptiness, neither existence nor non-existence, is the real. Inaccessible, unknowable, the real craved to know itself, to love itself, to reveal itself. And so began the endless and instantaneous journey into what we call existence what we know as life. That's kind of the Popol Vuh in a nutshell, the Mayan creation myth. That's what the great knowers in Heart of Heaven are looking for. That's another way of saying the real Heart of Heaven, newborn thunderbolt. I just want to read one last little thing from Emmanuel. So I say, welcome the unknown. Step into it with open arms. It is not an outer action, but an inner way of seeing. When we love and we praise, it is not landing on deaf ears. It is heard and there is a response. A great conversation can ensue. There is a call and there is a response. We must chant our being in all the ways that we as individuals can chant our being whether that be through song or silence. We must chant our being and we must dance in time, returning to the rhythms of the earth, acknowledging, 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 remembering, 
remembering, remembering, returning, returning, returning to this core of who we are, which unites us with everything in existence.